Ja, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Die Ringvorlesung zum Thema Krieg äh, geht weiter. I shift to English, so it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to me tonight to welcome Professor Barani from Columbia State University in New York, um, who, uh, who is a great specialist for Near Eastern archaeology for the ancient Near East, and who's also a great specialist for uh, for war and what we see about it in the Near East. So in all different sources from textual evidence to destructions which will uh, play a role in your, in your uh, presentation and the evaluation of these, uh, of these processes. So, and I don't want to, to make many words, but we are all keen to hear what you s will say about war in Mesopotamia, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank uh, the TOEFOI Excellence Cluster for inviting me to uh, speak here today. It's really a pleasure to be in Berlin, which is, as you all know, uh, one of the greatest centers of uh, Near Eastern scholarship. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, I have created a talk in which I'm going to cover uh, two seemingly disparate topics, but topics that I think are uh, interrelated. So I'm going to speak about uh, war and violence um, and the destruction of monuments in the ancient Near East, which is something which has been um, a part of my scholarship for many years. Uh, but uh, also at, towards the middle or the end of the lecture, I will switch uh, gears and I'm going to uh, move into the area of cultural destruction in Iraq and Syria today. Um, they, they seem to be two unrelated topics, but uh, I just couldn't see speaking about cultural destruction in antiquity in, in Mesopotamia while remaining silent about what's happening today. So I hope that you'll bear with me if I switch gears in this way and tell you about things that are happening now as well as uh, covering history. So I'll start with the first slide. So today I would like to uh, discuss how the destruction of monuments and conversely the preservation of monuments become aspects of warfare and violent conflict and also of legal discourse. As art historians and archaeologists, we are all aware that iconoclasm and monument destruction throughout history have been validated by the idea of just war, war that is just. While iconoclasm and collateral destruction are known to be aspects of warfare, preservation is also an aspect of conflict archaeology, what I would call conflict archaeology. I would like to present uh, my current fieldwork project to you also. Um, it's a project of preservation that fits within this field of conflict archaeology. But in order to introduce this work, I will first take you to the past, to the ancient Mesopotamian historical consciousness and how it was related to standing monuments and the historical architect architecture that was a part of their urban fab fabric in antiquity. So my lecture will go from the past to the present again. And I hope that by the end you will see my reasons for this atemporal outline. 2,500 years before the beginning of the Christian era, a Sumerian monument was erected in the south of modern-day Iraq. The monument, now in the Louvre Museum in Paris, is a large stele carved on both sides with relief images and inscribed with a long text about a war and its conclusion. Although much scholarly attention has been given to its various features, one small aspect of the ancient text I think hasn't been given due recognition and is rather noteworthy. 
among the oaths that were sworn to the gods at the end of the war and recorded here are promises to the warring parties uh, that, ni that neither of them would destroy nor dislocate the monument. To date, this is the earliest known historical monument in the world. It tells us that already at this time, so about, about 2500 BC, the deliberate destruction or removal of a monument from its site was taken as an act of war and a war crime. In today's scholarship and journalism about monument destruction in Iraq and Syria, we often hear or read that cultural preservation is a modern and Western concern, and that laws of war concerning what is now referred to as heritage with the capital H are aspects of Western modernity not recognized in earlier eras. This is not really the case, I would argue. I am presenting to you the evidence from antiquity not simply as a lesson in archaeology, but to make the case that human beings and monuments are always entangled in their histories. Mesopotamia stands as an example of at least one ancient culture where monuments were understood as having a vital agency of their own. This agency was not just ascribed to them, but inherent within their logic as monuments. And their destruction was seen as having direct effects on the people and the land, the king and his reign. As it was one of the most highly literate uh, cultures in antiquity, a great deal of textual and archeological evidence can make this case. The recent attempts to eradicate the past of Syria and Iraq is aimed at the obliteration of exactly this earliest Mesopotamian history, a history that local populations have long considered to be their own past and a basis for their collective memory, something that transcends religion and ethnicity. It is for this reason that historical monuments are now deliberately targeted, I think. It is a strategy that aims to create a terra nullius, a land that belongs to no one as, and has no prior historical claims, so that it is a no man's land available for conquest. Thus, the strategy of obliteration aims to create a land ready for the rewriting of history with a new vision cleansed from its pre-Islamic past and cleansed also of any evidence of thousands of years of existence of peoples and religions that do not suit the worldview of the ideology of Wahhabism. To counter that obliteration of history and to demonstrate how people and edifices were closely linked, I will recount the earliest writings on the place of monuments found in discourses of just war and war crimes and the significant textual and archeological evidence for the ancient concerns within architectural preservation and restoration. The ancient Mesopotamians who lived in what is now Iraq, northeastern Syria and southeastern Turkey were the first people to create inscribed historical monuments whose purpose was to endure into the distant future. We read in the ancient texts that their monuments were conceived of as site-specific works meant to be present for all time. Their inscriptions often address viewers who were to see the monuments in the distant future. These works were made of various materials and in many forms, including freestanding steles of sculpted and inscribed stones, relief sculptures carved on the cliffs of the mountainsides and set in magnificent works of architecture. Their materials, stone or brick, were considered to have inherent supernatural qualities. Their monumental buildings were both religious and secular. They also had a literature in Sumerian and Akkadian that praised these works as remarkable and astonishing things 
that future generations should admire. The first poetical descriptions of architecture we have, what we would uh, in the history of art call ekphrases, um, come from there. In these ancient texts, future generations were asked specifically to preserve these works. When monuments and architectural structures were destroyed, when cities were ravaged by war, laments and requiems were written and sung on behalf of the destroyed buildings, just as they were for the people who had been killed, enslaved, and devastated by war. They were all considered as aspects of the same all-encompassing destruction. These laments with their descriptions of civilian deaths and destruction of architecture are particularly poignant and moving in the context of today's violence. These acts of war and discourses of war and its aftermath were also defined as part of the May, um, capital M-E, the early Sumerian lists of concepts and things that were associated with civilization. The May included the arts, music, sculpture, and all kinds of positive creative things and activities, but they also included aspects of life that are negative, such as warfare. For the Mesopotamians, seeing war as part of the May was perhaps a way of acknowledging that warfare is an inevitable aspect of civilization. And therefore, rules of war, rules of war were established. The Sumerians already practiced what we would later call in Latin, jus ad bellum, or just war. The act of war against another city-state was not acceptable un unless it was at least rhetorically described as justified or defensive. The stele with which I began uh, this paper today was erected by Eanatum of Lagash and is the earliest historical monument we know. It's a monument to victory, but at the same time, it's also a contractual agreement, a peace treaty set up after the battle uh, between the city-states of Lagash and Uma. Before the battle with Uma, Eyanatum received a divine message in a dream oracle that sanctioned the war. And he justifies his battle as a defense of the territory to Lagash in southern Iraq. Already in the mid-third millennium BC, the Sumerians practiced diplomacy. Before a war, envoys were sent to find a diplomatic solution for border conflict. It was only when these failed that a messenger would be sent with a declaration of war in advance of the actual attack. The taking of the lives of others, even for the king and his military, was a source of great anxiety and required justification and sanction from the gods. Among the oaths that were made repeatedly were oaths related to the protection of monuments themselves. Kings had to swear that they would not transgress borders and also they had to swear that they would not destroy monuments. So the destruction of monuments was already defined as an act of war in the third millennium BC. Conversely, the destruction of a monument was considered the, uh, a legitimate reason to launch what they would consider a just war. Throughout Mesopotamian history, monument destruction or the theft and dislocation of monuments and statues often declared, uh, were often declared as the ostensible reason for launching a just war. As the text of Eanatum makes clear, the destruction of a monument was seen as a criminal act, and it was tantamount to the breaking of a peace treaty. The opposite side of this anxiety over the destruction is the ancient concern with preservation and conservation. Extensive information about restoration and preservation of works of historical architecture exist, especially in ritual texts. About 2,000 years after the Sumerian stele of Eanatum was erected, texts reveal that these kinds of concerns remained in full force. During the reconstruction of a building, the brick god required prayers. Instructions for architectural restoration <coughs> during the Seleucid era, so the fourth to the third centuries BC, say, and I quote from the ancient text here, quote, 
When the wall of a temple falls into ruins, in order to demolish and refound that temple, the definer shall investigate the site, presumably for ancient remains. The builder of the temple shall put on clean clothes and put a tin bracelet on his arm. He shall take an ax of lead, remove the first brick, and put it in a restricted place. You set up an offering table in front of that brick god of the foundation, and you offer sacrifices." End of quote. These instructions for the restoration ritual shows that our architectural rituals and preservation rites that had begun in Sumer in the third millennium BC still existed in some form thousands of years later in the fourth century BC, well after the arrival of Alexander the Great. The text orders the Kalu priest to remove the first brick and place it on an altar. The Kalu priest was then to sing the lamentations according to an age-old tradition of laments and dirges sung over the destruction of, the, of cities and their architecture. These laments had been sung over the destruction of cities for the terrible loss of temples and their magnificent sculptures during warfare as early as the third millennium. In the Seleucid ritual quoted above, uh, these were, there was in some sense um, a feeling that the original brick that was set up on the altar had to be appeased. It was the representative of the brick god Kula. Its removal from the original context of the building was thus played out as a de temporary dislocation while the repairs were being made as carefully as possible following the original uh, ground plans of the temple. When an ancient wall had to be pulled down and rebuilt, a process of mourning then had to take place in order to bridge the gap between the existence of the old wall and the rebuilding of the new. In another passage, the text also makes clear that the building site had to be surveyed by the Baru or the seer priest so that nothing would be inadvertently missed or damaged in the process of reconstruction. The ancient Mesopotamians were constantly concerned with the reverence and respect for the remains of the past, and Mesopotamia is the first place where we can study these acts of preservation in textual and archaeological evidence. We can even say that the reverence for the past and the concern with preservation of their ancient city was distinctive of Mesopotamia, and these concerns are at times similar to those of our own. From the middle of the third millennium BC, they buried deposits of statues and texts when they built significant buildings, and these were to be preserved by later generations. A lengthy compendium of omens known as Shumma'alu, meaning if a city, after its opening lines, shows the concern with preservation well. The text provides a long list of omens that have to do with conservation and preservation practice and makes clear that they are intended not only for the king and those in power, but also for the common people. So I'll just quote a few of them for you, but there are, uh, there's a, quite a list. If a man repairs a sanctuary, he will have good luck. If a man tears down a sanctuary, the river will swallow him. If someone relocates a chapel, that man will go to ruin. If a man repairs something old, that man's God will come to him." End of quote. These are but a few lines from a long list of uh, restoration and preservation of things, from, and they list things from images of gods and heroes to entire buildings and more limited architectural repairs. The text even has a section of concerns for surveyors who are planning to build at a particular location so that if a man plans to build a house and while digging the foundations, find something in the ground, he must follow particular procedures for preservation. All ancient objects found in the ground or their remains standing in temples or public buildings were, were considered to belong to the terrain and its history. Their preservation, their preservation was propitious for the people of the land and for the future. So despite the repeated cycles of war and devastation throughout the millennia, the antiquities of the land nevertheless survived 
in some form or another. When in the second century BC, the governor of Lagash, Adad Nadin Ahe and his builders found the statues of King Gudea who had set them up 2000 years earlier, the later ruler had them placed in his newly constructed palace. Not only did he collect them and set them up carefully for display, but he ordered his scholars and scribes who were able to read ancient languages and scripts to imitate the Sumerian method of building and of writing inscriptions so that he used his own, uh, so that he used them in his own palace. They made inscriptions written in Aramaic and Greek such a, in such a way that they look like the bricks inscribed with Gudea's name written in ancient Sumerian. This was one of the earliest extant forms of antiquarian collecting and study of the past, and it prefigures the interests and activities that we see, for example, in the Italian Renaissance. And here, I think you can see the brick with the bilingual inscription. We even know the names of particular scholars. In ancient Babylonia, there once lived a man called Nabu Zerlishir. He was a scholar who was expert in ancient languages and scripts. He also directed excavations and recorded the architectural remains and artifacts that were found under his supervision. He lived in the sixth century BC during the reign of the Babylonian king Nabonidus. But we know that he discovered remains of the mid second millennium BC from the time of the Kassite ruler, Kurigalzu I, who lived 800 years before him. He understood what they, these were and he recorded them accurately. And even these artifacts themselves already contained a record of the earlier Kassite archeological activity and interest in the past. Among those artifacts ex excavated by Nabu Zerlisher was a text that recorded how the Kassite king Kuri Galzu had preserved and restored the Eme Kalama temple wall in the city of Agade as a way of preparing the Akitu New Year festival at the beginning of springtime. Nabu Zerlisher studied the traces of the past in artifacts and architecture. He knew the ancient languages and scripts which he could read and translate and he, which he recorded carefully. Among the texts that he reproduced, he made a copy of it by pressing it on clay, was one that was even older than the Kurigalzu one that I mentioned. It was from the era of the Akkadian king Sharkalishari, who ruled 2217 to 2193 BC. On the back of the impression, Nabu Zerlisher in fact wrote carefully where he had found this text, which was already almost 2000 years by then, and its material. Nabu Zerlisher's story is not the only one we have from the Mesopotamian past. In fact, there are other records from the past that reveal to us the historical consciousness in Mesopotamia. The ancient Mesopotamians were very aware of the extensive history of their land. They understood with pride that it was extremely old. They felt it was their duty to preserve it. They saw it as their ancestral past. The Mesopotamians understood archeological artifacts or what we would call archeological artifacts now as traces of the past. But when they put artifacts into the ground or erected them as architecture and monuments, the important thing we should understand is this, that they saw them not simply as looking back to their ancestors, but as reaching out to the future as an infinite form of presence through monuments and images and through written accounts. Their his horizons of time were vast and distant, pushing forward into the future. Why was this the case? It was because of the manifest traces of the past, which also evidence the historical antiquity of the land. They saw the future through the lens of the traces of the past. 
The first historical evidence for, cons for conserving antiquities also comes from this part of the world. Um, we already say that writing was invented here, cities, the law, and so on. But we should add to this list of beginnings of civilization the practices of archaeology and conservation. The first clearly attested act of preservation, conservation and archaeological uh, research emerged here. The Uruk vase, and I'm sure you all know this vase very well, um, which became emblematic for the looting and destruction of the Iraq Museum in 2003, dates to about 3300 BC. When it was buried in the fourth millennium BC, it had already been repaired carefully with a metal pin attaching a piece that had been broken off at the top. This was a conscious act of conservation before it was discovered by um, archeologists in the early 20th century. Now I will uh, switch gears to monument destruction in our own time. I have covered this ancient historical information in some detail for several reasons. First of all, to point out that people and monuments are intertwined, and this entanglement was recognized in the literature and the rituals of antiquity. Secondly, preservation and conservation are not modern Western ideas, a claim that is now also used to justify the demolition of historical sites. The historical evidence is to the contrary, and is, it is exactly this evidence that is now being wiped out. Along with the murder and displacement of the population, the aim of this violent erasure is the rewriting of history and the re restructuring of the landscape for geopolitical goals. Rather than following cultural preservation policies that highlight heritage primarily in relation to tourist sites or concepts of global cultural heritage, we must consider the aims of this erasure, I think, uh, as it targets the local population and the local landscape. Groups such as ISIS claim that their destruction of pre-Islamic monuments and, ar and archeological sites, Shiite and Yazidi shrines, as well as Christian churches and monasteries are all justified acts of religious war, but their larger goals have clearly been territorial. While it is clear today, as the United Nations resolutions and international laws have acknowledged, that cultural destruction is an act of war and even a war crime that in August 2016, the International Criminal Court prosecuted in relation to the demolition of tombs in Timbuktu, this kind of prosecution has been somewhat selective. Many acts of direct targeting of heritage sites by UN member states pass without much comment from the international community. The historical and archeological scholarship on iconoclasm and memory has had very little to contribute here, preferring to focus on earlier historical examples rather than to anything that dates to the 2003 war in Iraq and its aftermath. Furthermore, much of the work on preservation in the war, in war today is closely linked with government policies. Heritage is destroyed in war, ancient sites are occupied or deliberately attacked, but restoration is now also used as a declaration of victory. Governments and organizations compete over the control of the restoration of sites as we saw was the case after the removal of ISIS from Palmyra in Syria. At the same time, many funding agencies in the United States at least, appear to be more concerned with the showcasing of new digital technologies rather than with tangible material or historical monuments. 
Some of these initiatives appropriate the heritage of Syria and Iraq for their own marketing purposes and profit in troubling ways. While one may expect some co companies to prefer the production of polyurethane replicas to restoring antiquities because of their own interests, there is now also an idea to place replicas on ancient sites themselves. This push for replicas has been aptly referred to uh, as a new digital colonialism by some archaeologists who have written about the ethics of 3D printing Syria's cultural heritage, such as the Arch of Palmyra that was shown in London and New York. The photograph here is, you see it in, in uh, the New York installation in Lower Manhattan. Interestingly, the policy of replicas placed on heritage sites is one that was tradi uh, traditionally rejected by UNESCO and by archaeological practices in general. One of the requi requirements for the inscription of a site as a UNESCO World Heritage Site is its quote-unquote authenticity. A decade ago, UNESCO rejected Iraq's bid to place Babylon on the wor World Heritage List because some walls on the site were not authentic. Ironically, replication on site using modern synthetic materials and 3D printing techniques is now being promoted as the best course of action for the future of sites in Iraq and Syria. Since 2003, war has dev devastated uh, these lands, Iraq and Syria. People have been killed and displaced, enslaved and tortured, cities demolished, and much more. In many cases, it is clear that the attacks on monuments are part and parcel of the strategy to erase the local populations and their histories, and to utilize culture as a means to divide and wipe out history and people alike. This aspect of the cultural destruction has had very little attention in comparison to the idea that places like Palmyra in Syria or Nimrud in Iraq are global cultural heritage. It is unfortunate that cultural heritage policy today often disassociates the historical site from both the landscape and the people. In September of 2016, pres the president of France, uh, Francois Hollande, announced a hundred million dollar fund to protect cultural heritage, especially in Syria and Iraq. These funds, once they are raised, are to be allocated to post-war restoration. While part of his plan was to offer asylum in Europe to artifacts, artifacts that are in danger to be placed um, in a safe house in Europe. While this is in no doubt an admirable pledge to protect culture, the reluctance to take in human refugees there stands out in marked contrast to the concern for heritage. The disconnection of history from the landscape and the people of the Middle East is exactly what earlier scholarship of Orientalist and post-colonial criticism attempted to point out. In the 19th century, collections of antiquities in museums such as the Louvre and the British Museum often presented their acquisition as a form of rescue from ignorant populations, unable to either understand or to value their past. This renewed dissociation in such preservation policy, official policy, is all the more surprising given the fact that the reason for the ISIS attacks on heritage sites such as Nimrud, Nineveh, Palmyra, as well as the religious shrines and sanctuaries of any undesirable religious group, from Christians to Sufis, Shiites, and Yazidis, is the erasure of the presence and the histories of the diversity of the people of Iraq and Syria, and the rewriting of the local history in their own vision, cleansed of the lives and histories of others. <laughs> 
at Columbia University's Art History and Archaeology Department, we had already been immersed in a field project before the ISIS takeover of Mosul and the de declaration of the caliphate there. The project, Mapping Mesopotamian Monuments, is a topographical survey that I direct. I first envisioned this project actually in 2004 when I was working in Iraq. And the project was originally a response, originally envisioned as a response to the destruction of heritage that had resulted from the 2003 war and occupation that followed. After waiting for US troops to officially withdraw from Iraq, thus ending, ending the US occupation of Iraq in 2011, I launched the field project in 2012 after the US uh, forces had left, the US and coalition forces had left. So we began the, the mapping monuments field survey in the north of Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and have to date covered the monuments, historical architecture, and the rock reliefs in the provinces of Dohuk, Erbil, and Suleimaniya, Suleimani. We have now documented on site and analyzed almost all the rock reliefs of Kurdistan um, in the days af be before and after the ISIS uh, takeover. As ISIS took over Mosul after our work began, we postponed the documentation of the region of Mosul until a later date, although we continued to work in the neighboring uh, governorates. Ships. The, the project is a topographical survey of standing historical architecture and monuments. It covers all historical periods from ancient to modern, in, including, I'm going to show you a few slides, a few examples of our work. Um, so, including uh, Mesopotamian rock reliefs in the cliffs, uh, this is a rock relief from uh, the early, um, from about 2000 BC um, in the Suleimani region. Early Christian monasteries and churches. This is one of the earliest uh, early Christian monasteries in the Middle East, uh, Rabban Hormuz. Um, Islamic monuments. This is a, a medieval uh, portal of the medieval citadel of Ahmadiyya in northern Iraq. And here we had uh, the good fortune to uh, document some uh, previously unknown and unpublished uh, reliefs of the Parthian period, and I'm in the process of publishing those now. Um, so that's, that was an, an additional um, thing that we did. Um, we, document, we also document Ottoman and 20th century architecture. How, these are houses from the Erbil Citadel, this is an example. So covering all historical eras and types of monuments. The wide range of places and monuments that we cover aims to record the rich diversity of this land and its history. The team that I direct is formed of archaeologists from Columbia University, of course, but also colleagues based in Iraq at the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, uh, both from Baghdad and um, from the directorates of antiquities in Iraqi Kurdistan. So we are um, a, a, a group of uh, archeologists uh, from various areas, mostly from Iraq. We work together on site and the information we produce can be taken up, um, is my hope, uh, for future preservation work. All of us on the team, not just myself, all of us on, t on the team, feel that it is a historical record, and I'll remind you that all of us on the team are actually um, Middle Eastern, we're all from this part of the world, um, 
we all feel that it is a historical record to counter deliberate erasure of our history. This kind of documentation can also be a source of evidence, perhaps, for future legal trials for war crimes and for any future demands for reparations for this destruction, um, which I think ought to take place. Some part of this work that we are conducting can now be seen on the Columbia University Art History Department website. The largest amount of the catalogued information, however, is now available only if one contacts our uh, content curator directly. Decisions about open access have been difficult in the past years because of the deliberate targeting of sites in Iraq and Syria. While the aim of the project is to have open access to all, we have had to face the reality of dangers for our, both of our team and that our website might provide locations and information that could be used as target sites. Um, so that although the project has existed, the, our project was initiated in 2012, but we have uh, remained completely silent about it and not sought any publicity at all. As I have mentioned already, the problems of preservation in war we are facing today also include the fact uh, that state actors and occupying powers often have hasty restoration or preservation initiatives as a way to claim, to claim victory. This was clearly the case with a statement by both Russia and UNESCO that they planned to restore Palmyra as soon after it was retaken from ISIS. In a response to this declaration, a group of archaeologists, and I was among them, wrote a letter to UNESCO asking them that no restoration take place until the site could be surveyed. Lest one think that the Palmyra restoration plan was unique, such work at ancient sites had already taken place in Iraq during the US military occupation, where I was unfortunately an eyewitness at the time. I'm speaking about 2003 and 2004. While preservation and destruction have long, long been linked to war and political policy, we now have the added interests of private technology companies setting agendas for preservation work and its method. In the midst of all of this international planning for the future of the historical architecture, monuments, and sites of Iraq and Syria, what we have barely heard are the voices of the local scholars and the archaeologists, or anything about the history of archaeology and preservation in this region. And that's not because they don't exist or they haven't tried. The rise of scientific archaeology in Europe in the 19th century brought about a new and different engagement with the past that defined itself as a science. This was an important moment in the history of scholarship and museology, a turning point that formed the basis for the way that we conduct our scientific work today. However, it was certainly not the first historical moment in which there was an interest in these ruins. In the early Arabic and Persian tradition of Islamic scholarship, writers such as Ibn Hawqal, who flourished 943 to 69 AD, already went to see Babylon and wrote about it in the 10th century AD. Yaqut al-Rumi's compendium of the 12th century AD discusses most of the ancient cities of the Near East, including, by the way, Palmyra, Petra, Babylon, and Nineveh, among others. Uh, Benjamin of Tudela, a rabbi from Spain, described the ruins of the palace of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, where he visited. Ibn Jubair, who lived 1145 to 1217 AD, and Abu al-Fida, 1273 to 1331 AD, Mas'udi, who died 957 AD, and Muqaddasi, 945 to 1000 AD, and several others, I won't list them all, had regularly described the exact locations of Nineveh and Babylon. In the Ottoman Empire, Mehmet Zili, known as Evliya Chelebi, 
described ancient buildings during his travels in his Siyahat Nama written in the mid 17th century. In Iran, the Qajar dynasty likened its authority to that of ancient kings documented pre-Islamic sites with photography already in the mid 19th century. These sites and monuments, these remains of history, have formed and defined the landscape of the region for many centuries. We, without them, we cannot understand what the region is, nor what it has been. When we ignore them, the region becomes something else. It becomes a place with no tangible past, a place whose history is wiped out and rewritten. Why is this the case? History is always a narrative, but the phenomenon of the solid material remains have stood there nevertheless and have had to be explained or subsumed into the stories. The standing monuments and traces of the past were explained as part of the ancient and mythical history of the land and its people. For the first time in thousands of years, these remains are now being wiped out. We are now faced with confronting not a solid, tangible presence of the past, but a conspicuous and glaring absence. Entirely new definitions and stories are being told that fit better with the current goals of conquest. This ancient land is being erained, erased and transformed. Transformed into an empty land devoid of people and history. These aims and strategies of violence are enabled by and erected upon the absence of the past. I would stress, therefore, that the evidence of the past and history is not just the collateral damage of war, it is dis it, its destruction is a strategy of erasure, reconfiguration, and conquest. What is worrying is not just the deliberate destruction and iconoclasm of heritage, but a total erasure of what seems not to fit into the new narrative of ethnic or religious purity. Thus ancient sites, Islamic architecture, and 20th century secular buildings are all attacked for similar reasons. This destruction has several causes. We have seen the devastating destruction of sites by terrorism and warfare, whether by state powers and the military or by terrorist groups. But that is not all. The creation of exclusionary narratives is beginning to take hold across communities. We are also seeing the rewriting and re-identification of heritage sites of all eras, ancient to modern, along ethnocentric lines in ways that are erroneous and unacceptable because they perform historical erasure in their own way. We see the mass looting of sites, museums, and libraries for a global free market in our heritage. And we are also witnessing the terrible damage done by unrestrained and unsupervised development projects that do not always follow the rule of law when it comes to conducting surveys before bulldozing, drilling, or tearing down old architecture and traditional urban centers. Here, the burden of responsibility is not only on local people and governments, but on international firms that come to conduct their work in our countries. Monument destruction in Iraq and Syria is certainly a question of global cultural heritage, as defined by UNESCO, but it is urgent and devastating for the people of the lands. On the other hand, local people have a responsibility as well to protect this heritage and to educate uh, children, their children about it, and to do this without falling into the trap of ethnocentricity and exclusionary sectarian politics. For my part, I feel that as we are not emperors and kings, but scholars and archaeologists, like our great ancestor, Nabu Zerlisher, it is only by research and documentation by the taking on of students and postdoctoral researchers into our home institutions, by adopting archaeological and preservation projects together with our colleagues there, and by having open lines of communication that we can counter this existential threat to our shared history. Thank you.